All right, welcome to today. We are going to do chapter five in the book. And five is probably one of the most fun chapters for me because there seems to be a logical process to it. And people tend to either get this chapter like that or they tend to have a little trouble with it. I have literally had students in class before say, well, how many questions on the test? And I'm like, well, four or five. They're like, okay, I'll dismiss them all and get everything else right. But literally, once you get the logic behind the, this legal addressing, it is pretty fun and uh, you probably won't miss it once you get it on there. All right, so now normally when we're in a live classroom, I tend to try and make fun of a person, but I'm not gonna do that today because I almost always get somebody that calls me and says, hey, I'm at 432 South Emerson, where are you at? And I'm like, well, I'm right here. And they're like, well, I, I'm next to a railroad track. Well, I've never been to 432 South Emerson in Indianapolis, but apparently there's a railroad track. So I always tell them, hey, I'm at 432 South Emerson in Greenwood. And they're like, oh crap, I'm at the wrong place. And then I mess with them, I'm like, is that Greenwood, Indiana or Ohio? The point I'm trying to make here is that the street address is the worst method of identifying property there is because of the confusion of repeating numbers, repeating streets, repeating city names, all of that. So they tried to come up with a method that would identify every piece of property independently of each other. And if you remember back in chapter one, just a few days ago, we talked about every property is unique. And I told you, if you stuck with us, I would prove that to you. Today, we're going to do that. Every property has its own unique legal address that identifies it from every other place in the world. And if we used legal addresses in a manner that uh, we understood quickly, we would never get lost. Unfortunately, when you throw the word legal in, it makes things very complicated. So we're gonna start there on page 68 of the book. I really need my book like right here. That would probably be a lot smarter of me. Um, and talk about the ways to describe property. There are three ways that they have come up with to describe the legal address of a property. The first one is the simplest one. It is called the meets and bounds definition or the meets and bounds method. The meets and bounds literally means a distance, and a direction. And it's very simple to understand because you actually just talk about the meets or the, the difference in the distance and the bounds. For example, you would start here at this thing and they label it as the point of beginning. And then you simply describe it as going 200 feet east to some monument. Now, the word monument here does not mean like a headstone monument or something of that nature. It means an identifying piece of real estate or an identifying marker. That marker can be man-made. Typically, it is a spike driven in the ground and you will see these if you walk out in the road. Please look for traffic if you do that. And occasionally you will see like the head of a spike driven into the ground. That is a monument that surveyors use. It could also be a naturally occurring piece of real estate like the old oak tree or a body of water or something of that nature. So that monument is something here that describes the end point of that distance. And then it would simply say, and then 200 feet south to some other monument, 200 feet west to some other monument. And then it would go 200 feet north 
Now, here's the key to the meets and bounds. It must end where it began. So typically, you will see the last distance that says something to the effect of 200 feet north and back to the point of beginning because it must close that box. If something happened and you mismeasured and you ended up with something that looked like this, that would drive title companies crazy and probably stop the closing. So it's going to say something like 200 feet north and back to the point of beginning so that you in fact close this loop so that you have encompassed an entire piece of property. So that monument are the defining boundary corners. Now, the meets and bounds uses two things that the others do not use, which make this meets and bounds kind of a vital area. One is it uses angles. The other two you will see are actually just vertical squares and rectangles. This one allows for angles to be used in it. And the second thing it has is this very technical plus or minus, eh, plus or minus. So it allows for a plus or minus change in the property. Now, what I want to do in the book, there is a figure 3.1 or 5.1, depending on where you're looking. Now it's figure 5.1, and I want to actually read you the description, and while I'm reading it, I want you to follow along in the book, all right? So basically it says, a tract of land located in Red Skull, Boone County, Virginia, described as the following. Beginning at the intersection of the east line of Jones Road and the south line of Skull Drive. That is the point of beginning. In that figure, you will see a little star and it is actually labeled point of beginning. So that's where we are starting this description. Then east along the south side of Skull Drive for 200 feet. Then south 15 degrees, there's the angle east, 265 and a half feet, more or less, to the center thread of the Red Skull Creek. Now, why is it more or less? It is more or less, remember, because they're using a naturally occurring body of water, a creek, as the boundary or the monument. And we learned in the other chapters that you can get accretion, or erosion, and in theory, that that lake or that river could move a little bit because of the accretion or the erosion. So it's 216 and a half feet, more or less, to the center thread of the creek. Now, time out for a second. The center thread implies two different things to you. One, is that this creek or body of water or river is not navigable, meaning you can't get a boat down it because you own to the center thread of the creek. And because that is a river, the owner of this would get those riparian rights that would define their use of the water, okay? If they owned to the creek bank, then it would be defined as a navigable river, okay? So let's go back and then northwesterly along the center line of the creek to its intersection with the east line of Jones Road, then north 105 feet more or less along the east line of Jones Road and back to the point of beginning. Now, notice there was another 105 feet north, more or less, once again, because that creek could move. So what I ended up drawing was something that looked a little like this. It started here, it went over here, it went down an angle, and that angle was 15 degrees, 
And then it went to a body of water. I like to play with the colors. And then it goes back up to the point of beginning. And that is the picture that you see in figure 5.1. This here is the piece of property we are bounding it by using those meets and bounds direction. That would be the legal address for that property or the legal description. Well, that's all fine and dandy, except there's one problem with the meets and bounds. The meets and bounds is really good for 200 feet, 300 feet, but all of a sudden we start getting into 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet. You know, you get people with huge acres of land. Anybody ever been to the Biltmore residence? He owned property. Okay, so you know where it's at and what is it, South Carolina? He owned property all the way to Virginia. Hence, that's where Vanderbilt University came from because he donated the property for the college. Think about that. He owned from South Carolina to Tennessee. So that kind of property, you start running into issues with meets and bounds when you start saying, well, it's 418,000 feet that way. So they had to come up with a second method. And this second method in your book is called the rectangular survey method, or sometimes you hear it called the governmental survey method. Now, this is a very unique item, and I am impressed and awed by what this really is. Think about this. This was done in 1785, and they did virtually in the entire United States. And they had to do this by foot. So there are people that walked across the country to do this. I mean, we're having trouble with going to work in this situation right now. And here, these guys were gone 17 years at a time to do some of this stuff. And they worked on what was called a chain gang. And if you think about the football and how they mark the first down in football, this is literally how they did it here. They had two guys, each with a pole, and one would pull and pull that chain tight so they can measure an exact distance, and then the other would pass him and do it again. And that's how they measured it. The same concept we measure first down markers. You know, here, and they pull it tight, that's 10 yards, and then they move it, and there's 10 yards. So it's the same concept, only a little different. They did this through the entire United States. Now, the nerd in me actually went down and found this thing called a pivot point, and I've got pictures of me standing on this historical marker pointing to it because there is one point, and we'll get to just a second, here in Indiana. 